Okay, we're talking about fluid kinematics. Um, and we're going to talk about some vocab now. The first one is a streamline. So um, the thing that makes a streamline a streamline is that it is always tangent to the velocity. Remember, uh, we're trying to do engaged learning here. So when you're filling out your own notes, try to rephrase what I'm writing. Write it in a different way. Add extra extra notes about that. What is, for example, what does being tangent mean when you're tangent to something? Well, um, in 2D, in 2D, we know that the slope um, of the streamline is equal to the slope of the, the fluid. So if we have uh, a fluid with a streamline, sorry, a fluid that's flowing like this, uh, like, I use the wrong colors here, but we'll just try it, like this. We know that at this point, the slope of the, uh, of the fluid, the fluid velocity, has to be equal to the slope of the um, streamline. And this is just equal to the vertical velocity, V, divided by, the, or over the um, horizontal velocity, U. For 2D flow, for 3D flow it gets more complicated, but we're gonna stick with 2D flow like we talked about to keep the complexity low. So this is gonna be equal to V over U. Um, and in some cases we can separate and integrate to find the equation of a streamline. Um, so this requires, of course, that we have a mathematical expression for the vertical velocity, the y velocity, and a horizontal velocity. And if we have mathematical expressions for those, then we can Again, sometimes separate and integrate. Now the next two definitions um, look the same, but they're very different. So a streamline is a mathematical construct. Then it's really useful when you have um, expressions for the velocity at a function as a function of position everywhere, position and time, everywhere, like you would you get from a computational fluid dynamics program um, or mathematically solving Navier-Stokes equation. Now here a streak line is an experimental um, tool. It is the position of all fluid particles that have passed through a single point. So um, if we want to uh, if you if you want to think of something you've seen before, you can think of a car commercial. where uh, car commercial where um, they have smoke smoke from these little pipes that they, they do and the smoke is traveling over the car and they're watching it and they're like, ooh, we're doing a good job. Um, Another excellent example of this is if you go to the UBMAE website and go to the research tab, and then um, they have uh, research focuses, and you go to the fluid thermal science one. Um, Dr. Ringette does a lot of streak line imaging where he'll take multiple colors of dye and he'll release them from um, dye injectors, which are just tubes that are uh, inserted into the flow, um, small tubes, and we can watch how the dye that leaves through that point then wraps around like a flapping wing, and we can get a lot of information about how the flow goes, mostly about like vortices and things like that. So under what conditions are a streak line and streamline equivalent? Well, if um, we're worried about the position of all fluid particles that are passing through a single point, um, they're equivalent during steady state conditions. So if our streak streamlines are not changing with time, 
then they will always pass through the same point and all of the smoke particles that are released at that point will also, let's draw our smoke particles as, oh, we have a gray, this is good, let's try it. Um, let's say here's our, our here's our release point. If our streamline is not changing with time, then all of those smoke particles will continue to follow that streamline. However, if our streamlines are changing with time, then they'll start to follow that streamline, but the streamline will change and they'll wave around and they'll do something else that looks completely different than the snapshot of a streamline um, at one point. Um, and the reason for that is, is because the smoke particle that's released at time zero will follow the streamline for time zero, but the smoke particle that's released at time t0 plus some small delta t will follow that next streamline which is different and so what you end up getting is you get every smoke particle follows a different streamline and you get a weird kind of path that is um, each particle is on its own streamline and you're getting kind of this weird um, I don't even know how to say it like a chain that that like crosses all these streamlines but like I said, it's really useful for finding um, certain characteristics of a flow like uh, some uh, the amount of turbulence or if you're trying to um, find vortices, you can use it to identify the location of vortices and, and the strength of vortices and things like that. Now a path line is, is different. A path line is the path... that a single particle takes. So if we're going to uh, extend the car analogy now, this is um, like the streaks that uh, car lights make during long exposures on cameras. Right, so you see, I'm not even going to try to draw a car, but you you see in car commercials all the time, right? There'll be this long streak for the tail lights or something like that, it's supposed to make the car look like it's going fast or something. Um, but what you get is you get the path that a single particle takes, and what that path is is the path. Um, so you can imagine it's uh, well, it's the path that a single smoke particle would make, right? So when we have the smoke chain, where we have uh, just a continuous chain of particles that are all flowing through the flow. When we look at path lines, we have single individual particles that we image. We usually use a long exposure um, so that they end up creating these streaks. Um, this is really useful because, uh, uh, again, we can do sh kind of short exposures, shorter than we, uh, so we get short streaks, but these short streaks, like let's say we have a bunch of particles in a flow and we're trying to look at path lines, we can get these path lines that look like this, right? And if we did that, we would know that we have high velocities that are going around in a circle on the outside. We could even literally draw arrows on these and we would get a rough idea of what the velocity flow is in the fluid, right? So we can get a, a, an okay idea of what the 2D or 3D velocity flow is from these path lines, um, usually in 2D. Um, they're still not quite as useful as uh, streamlines, but um, streamlines require you to have a very accurate model of the computational model of the fluid, and that's not always possible. For example, at high Reynolds numbers, we still don't have a very accurate way of simulating fluids. Um, we, we could simulate what, well, we'll get to Navier-Stokes equations, but they become computationally intractable after a, a period of time, just because there's just too much to worry about. And actually, they come, it, it scales with the Reynolds numbers. So if you have high Reynolds numbers, like Reynolds numbers of a million or so, it's very difficult to do what they call direct numerical simulation of Navier-Stokes. And when are they equivalent to streamlines? Same idea, right? Um, during steady state, the path that a uh, particle takes is going to be the exact same as a streamline because it's going to follow that streamline. So our little particle, which we'll talk about in green, is going to, if we drop it here on this streamline, if it's steady state, it's going to continue to follow this streamline, right? 
However, if it's non-steady state, this particle will follow the streamline at t0, but that streamline is going to change with time, and so the streamline at t, t plus 2 is going to be different than the initial streamline, so we'll get, end up getting two different lines. So only during steady state are they equivalent, which is why for a, a long time um, a lot of experimental fluid mechanics was limited for quantitative analysis to uh, steady state phenomenon until we invented like PIV and um, uh, Doppler velocimetry and things like that. For non-steady state uh, flow, people tended to use like hot wire anemometers, not anemometers. Anyway, they use hot wires, which are literally exactly what they sound like, little tiny wires, you make a little wishbone like this put a wire in between and it heats up and then based on the amount of uh, the velocity of the fluid flow it will cool down and the amount that it cools down you can measure by its change in resistance which gives you the velocity flow at that point but you can get very high frequencies with this you can measure turbulence and things like that all right so let's actually use everything we've learned so we're given a Eulerian point of view description of the velocity so here is our u here is our v and here is our w and remember u is a function of x y z and t here we only have y but we could have x and z and t in there um, here our v is a function of x y z and t but we only have x and our w it happens to be zero um, and what we want to know is we want to plot a streamline that passes through the point r zero and what we'll see is that streamlines are tremendously useful for visualizing flow because you look at this and you're like, I have zero idea what this flow looks like. Um, but when we calculate the streamline, we'll find out that um, it's, it's, it's very recognizable. So, uh, all right, so we need to plot this flow. So uh, when we do the streamline, step one is to uh, find an equation for the streamline. So we write... Uh, let's stop using green. So step one, find equation, the general equation, and we'll see why it's general here in a second, uh, of the streamline. So we have dy dx is equal to v over du, u, v over u, and we just plug in our u and our v. So this is equal to x plus 1 over y minus 3. And again, if you see a dy dx is equal to something like this, you, I hope you can't help but integrate this, right? So we're going to separate and integrate. y minus 3 dy is equal to x plus 1 dx, and we're going to integrate this, and we get y squared over 2 minus 3y plus c is equal to x squared over 2 plus x. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So now we have our general equation. This is our general equation for a streamline. And we want to now make it a specific one, right? And the specific equation that we're looking for is the equation that goes to the point 0, 0. So the point that goes through the, the streamline that goes through the origin is the one we're searching for. So to solve for C, you've done this a lot of times, you just plug in X and Y. So we have 0 minus 0 plus c is equal to 0 plus 0, so c is equal to 0. So our specific equation for our streamline is y squared over 2 minus 3y plus c. Oh, sorry. I was thinking ahead and lost track of where I was. Is equal to x squared over 2 plus x. Now if we want to plot this, um, the thing I recommend is we know that this is the equation of an ellipse, right? So let's... Uh, Let's just try to find its intercepts and then draw an ellipse that goes through those intercepts. So we have, let's look at uh, the intercepts for x is equal to 0. 
we have y is equal to, well, for, when x is equal to 0, then we have y times y over 2 minus 3 is equal to 0, which gives us two, two roots for this equation. y is equal to 0, so we have y is equal to 0, and y is equal to um, 6. So we know that our ellipse is going to go through our origin, which is exactly what we hoped, and the point x is equal to 0, y is equal to 6. So we're going to put a point up there. We're going to call that 6. Now let's look at y is equal to 0. And for the record, you might not have any roots at all. So this isn't the greatest way to do this, but it's one way to plot this. So y is equal to 0. We have um, x times x over 2 plus 1 is equal to 0, which gives us roots at x is equal to 0 and negative 1 becomes negative 2. Negative two. So we have, again, our 0, 0 and our negative 2, which would be right about here. So I'm going to draw an ellipse that goes through these. Not going to be a great ellipse. But that's our... <laughs> Imagine an ellipse that goes through those three points. Um, now, for the record, three points does not uniquely define an ellipse. That might not be exactly what it looks like, um, but it's going to be something close to that. Excellent. So, we've used our Eulerian point of view to describe a streamline, and what we found is that our fluid flow uh, goes around in a circle. And if we were to extrapolate, we'd probably find that these... Uh, streamlines continue to grow around like this and what we have is we have a vor vortex that we're uh, plotting here um, an elliptical vortex um, yeah and something that's interesting it would be to try to plot the stagnation point so if we wanted to plot a stagnation point so right stagnation when the flow of velocity is equal to zero if we wanted to plot that we would plot uh, when this is, uh, so V is equal to 0, 0 is equal to Y minus 3 I hat plus X plus 1 J hat. So this is going to be equal to, Y is going to be equal to 3, and X is going to be equal to negative 1. So our stagnation point is going to be halfway down here and halfway over here. So that's, that is the point at which the fluid velocity is zero, which is right in the middle of our ellipse, set of ellipses. So this is clearly um, rotational flow. And um, let's see if we can actually give a direction to the rotational flow. So when x is positive, our rotational flow is also positive. So um, it's going around in this direction. Like this. So streamlines are super useful for being able to visualize how a flow goes. And if you ever see computational, the results from computational fluid dynamics uh, simulations, they'll often show some streamlines um, flowing around an object. Um, and if those streamlines are twisting and turning with time, then there's they're the, the they're the time time evolving streamlines for the, the the situation. It's not steady state. Great, and that's that's it for our introduction to um, kinematic fluid kinematics.